and he goes back to New York. Now, a couple things. The last time that Teresa and Barton met at their secret house, there was a person wrapped in a shawl, and it was a man, because he spoke with some people, watching them. So they were being watched by a man, and they didn't see him as they went into the house, but he saw them for sure, and that's very well documented. So you've got a man who is stalking them. I think the most likely candidate is, you know, the person who stalked her before, right? The guy who was in love with her, the guy who followed her around before. Most, right? It's abnormal behavior happening twice within a two-year period. Um, So his handwriting didn't match the handwriting that I found. He he ends up serving in the Civil War. And so I found his letter letter of resignation from the Army. Uh, It doesn't match his handwriting. But I still think it's possible that he could have used a scribe and that he could have had someone else do the handwriting for him. I will tell you one interesting conclusion I got from my handwriting expert was that whoever wrote the letter had no fear of having their handwriting detected. And so we know this person didn't want to be found out because they used a pseudonym and because they never revealed themselves. So we know they didn't want to be found out. We also know this is a person who completely, uh, you know, wrote a relaxed letter, wasn't worried about disguising their handwriting and so uh, I think that would be, you know, that would fit in with the theory that, that this person had hired a scribe. Another thing, he receives a letter the same day as Sickles. We will later learn during the trial. The letter to Key does not exist, but we know it, it told him that Sickles was aware of the affair and that he needed to be on guard. So this sounds like someone who wants these two men to have a collision. Uh, maybe one will kill the other, they'll both kill each other, or one will end up in prison and the other dead. So this seems like someone who's interested in Teresa, right? There there were theories in the press that this was a woman who was jealous of Teresa, that she wanted Barton Key for herself. Well, then it wouldn't make sense to set up Daniel Sickles to kill the guy you want to be with, right? That doesn't make sense. There were many different ways you could have accomplished the same objective. So it could have been someone like, like Iago from Othello who just causes problems for the sake of causing problems and just could have been bent on, on, on mischief. Not the most satisfactory answer. So you've got a letter writer who's setting these two people up for a collision. And then this person writes a third letter during the trial to the jury, urging them to convict Daniel Sickles. And that third letter actually bears a New York postmark. And so Beekman, who's the man I'm talking about, who's the stalker of Teresa, he lives between D.C. and New York. His primary residence is in New York. There are things named after the Beekman family in New York City. If you're familiar with New York City, that's him. It's the same family. So it makes perfect sense that this person could both be in D.C., but in New York, in love with Teresa, trying to get both men out of the way so that you can have Teresa for yourself. But unfortunately, a theory that will probably never be proven one way or the other. Hey, everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. That's interesting. It sounds like she, as a socialite in Washington, D.C., would have attracted the attention of many, maybe somebody who had uh, unhealthy, it sounds like stalkerish tendencies and unrequited love and then took it and uh, tried to mastermind this plan that went horribly wrong. But we don't know. So there's a lot of ways this could go. So how does Washington and American high society react? Is this the O.J. Simpson trial of the antebellum period or something else? Yeah, absolutely. It's O.J., but in the antebellum period and in D.C. instead of in Hollywood. That's the big difference. While society is scandalized, some people really feel as though Sickles is in the wrong. Some people really feel as though Barton Key is in the wrong. Everyone seems to think Teresa is in the wrong, regardless of whether they're a Key or Sickles partisan. So so Teresa, interestingly, she gets denied her agency in the matter. So it's always written up that Barton Key is the seducer of Teresa, that she's not an adult with agency, but that she was seduced by this man. But while denying her agency, she gets 100% of the blame or nearly 100% of the blame. And so she's the one who actually gets cast out of society. She's the one whose friends stop visiting her. And she's all alone in this house in Lafayette Square. 
and her friends aren't coming by to visit. Nobody's coming by to be with her during this really traumatic and tough time. She's done in society for good. And uh, if Sickles had divorced her, she probably would have been unable to remarry. And so she really gets the worst of all worlds. And so what you see happening in this case also is a use of the telegraph for the first time, really the beginning of breaking news. So you had this situation where you had newspapers for the very first time covering human interest stories, covering true crime, right? Old newspapers focused on politics, where they focused on the shipping news, you know, prices of commodities, what ships were coming in and what ships were going, really boring stuff. And you have the advent of the penny press, starting in New York with the Sun, where they're going to cover all the things that fall under the, the umbrella of news today. As one publisher put it, uh, human interest stories, uh, crime, fire, animal stories, but also politics and business. Uh, and so you've got the stage set. You've got these newspapers that are for a mass audience. You've got the telegraph just scaling throughout the United States where people can learn about things almost in real time. Uh, and all the, all the kindling is there. And then Sickles is the one who fires the shot. Um, and so you have um, people racing to get editions of newspapers throughout the day to try to find out the latest news about the Sickles affair or the Washington tragedy, as it was known. Um, so it's really a first of its kind event in American history, certainly the most covered event in human history up until that point, and one that we would all find, uh, unfortunately, familiar today. Right. You say that this case birthed the modern media frenzy. As reports are going out on the telegraph wire, people are learning about the event and what's unfolding in the trial the day after it takes place. Is the public awareness and the media feeding frenzy of the trial affecting the trial in the way that other high profile criminal trials like the O.J. Simpson case affected by the media, too? It's so interesting that you say that, because I think it's still a matter of debate how much having the public's eyes on a case actually affects the outcome, right? Like to take one very, very public case that happened uh, just down the street from me in Phoenix, uh, the Jody Elias case, right? Um, so certainly the public interest made it a longer trial, um, you know, ensured that she got the best lawyers defending her and prosecuting her. But like ultimately it ended up with a guilty verdict which is how it would have ended up if no one had paid attention to it. Um, and so you wonder, you know, did it affect the outcome of this case? I don't think so, but I think it's so hard to measure how public scrutiny of a trial and public interest in a trial ha impacts the trial itself. Well, what were some of the key moments and highlights of the case as it's unfolding and why were people so fascinated by it beyond just the initial, the initial crime that took place. Yeah, so you have the formation of the first legal dream team. So you have James Brady, who's probably the best lawyer in the country at the time, certainly the best in New York and a legend in that city, and a friend of Sickles coming down from New York with another New York lawyer named John Graham to defend Daniel Sickles. But you also have Edwin Stanton, who's on the verge of eternal fame as Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of War during the Civil War. At this point, he's just a very prominent lawyer in Washington, D.C. He's a leader on the Sickles defense team. You know, they have local lawyers who are a little bit more familiar with the jury pool, a little bit more familiar with the judge. Uh, and so they have this well-rounded team of lawyers who works very well together, uh, despite what should have been a real clash of egos, really seems to, to gel and work together for the purpose of securing Sickles' release. On the prosecution side, uh, you have the new U.S. attorney, who was Barton Key's deputy, who really was running that office. Key was always sick or focused on something else, and he often uh, allowed his deputy to, to step in and take on more of the load. And so this person now gets appointed by James Buchanan uh, to do the prosecution, along with a lawyer named Carlisle who Sickles initially tried to get for his team. Carl is a very good friend of Key. He's going to serve as a special prosecutor in this case, try to get his friends 
murderer convicted. And so you have these fantastic lawyers, really as much courtroom talent as ever uh, had been in the same courtroom up to that point. And you have an old judge, by the name of Crawford, who's appointed by President Polk, who presided over just about every criminal trial in Washington, D.C. in that intervening time. And so you have this uh, fantastic, so you couldn't have asked for a better setup in the courtroom to try this really interesting case. All right. So, yeah, what happens? What are the strategies of the prosecution and the defense? So the prosecution, it's just a very straightforward case. Sickles killed Key on a Sunday afternoon. There were plenty of witnesses. They line them up. You know, one witness after another takes the stand, what they saw, what they heard. There's some medical evidence um, by, the, by the coroner and by a Navy doctor who was the first to respond on the scene. And they make the point that regardless of the reason, we can't have a society if people are just going to go around killing other people, whatever their motivation. And however, however salutary you may think that they are, we can't, we can't have a society on this basis. And so you can't just go around killing people. Sickles did absolutely kill Key. They argued Key was unarmed. Key wasn't expecting it. And so it's just cold-blooded murder. That's the prosecution strategy. Defense strategy is manifold. They argue first that it should be a complete defense to the crime of murder if you kill someone who's having an affair with your wife. That's the first thing that they argue. It's contrary to the law, contrary to any case precedent, but that's their first argument. Secondarily, they say if that, if that doesn't satisfy you, maybe Sickles was acting in self-defense. You don't know that he wasn't. So there's a gun that was found at the scene that didn't match one of the balls that was taken out of Barton Key. Um, the answer for that actually is because Sickles used multiple guns. Um, and th that was the one they recovered from the crime scene. But the, the ball that was shot into Key was from a different one of Sickles' guns. But the, the defense tries to muddy the waters there and suggest, well, maybe it was maybe Key pulled this gun on Sickles and maybe Sickles was defending himself. None of the witnesses were close enough. Can't say for sure you got to let him go. But third, they argue for the first time in an American courtroom, if none of those other theories are availing, Sickles was temporarily insane, that he was insane long enough to commit this crime and no longer. So that's a three part uh, defense strategy for acquitting Sickles. Well, that's interesting. The use of the temporary insanity defense. Why was it not used until then? Was it desperation by the defense? Was it a very novel strategy cooked up by his lawyers? Something else? So the insanity defense throughout history had been, well, if you're going to get off by reason of insanity, it has to be because you were no different than a wild beast. You know, the same way an animal would attack someone, that's how diminished your capacity has to be to get off of a crime for that reason. Obviously not a very modern and not a very nuanced understanding of mental health, right? I mean, the guy who shot at the King of England because he thought he was ushering in the second coming of Christ, um, that guy was going about his life, going about his business more or less normally, but he's clearly mentally insane. And so the UK courts, start adopting uh, these tests uh, that sort of reflect a more modern understanding of mental health and how it can confuse someone, convince someone that they're doing the right thing when they're really doing the wrong thing. And so that just starts to make its way over to American courts. And so you have the insanity defense and usually it's sufficient, uh, but you had in this instance, people that Sickles was talking to right before the crime and people that he was talking to right after the crime, including the Attorney General of the United States, whose house Sickles went to go surrender himself after the shooting. So they had to come up with something else than a, a straight insanity defense. And their argument was that he was temporarily insane. How did people react to that in the press? Did they think, well, that's absurd, temporary insanity? Or did it make people consider, huh, I never thought about it that way before? Well, you know, it's interesting I think from the jury's perspective, they weren't falling for 19th century pseudoscience. I think that was like a really, that was a vehicle for letting him go if they wanted to. 
Um, I just think people's understanding of mental health was such at the time that they didn't have any reason 